thought that God brought me to Compass and, and uh, started like convicting me of my sin and all these Bible verses to make me a better Christian, you know, because I was like a struggling Christian, right? That's what I told myself. Um, but I was like, man, like what if, what if God actually brought me here not to be a better Christian, to become a Christian? I often question, really, if I was right with God, but tried my best to convince myself that I was simply a struggling Christian. Well, you, you can be a Christian, you can just struggle with sin. It's just a struggle. And so I kind of settled for that. Like, well, I'm a Christian. I know I'm a Christian. But honestly, in my heart, I knew I had no idea what the gospel was. I did not understand what repentance was. Compass was the first place I actually heard about repentance. I did everything in the flesh, and I felt exhausted. Probably two years ago, I really just uh, started questioning my faith, and I just didn't feel like... I knew. I knew I was going to hell. I knew it. After searching and searching and searching for God, I went to Catholic, I went to um, Jehovah's Witness. I started to focus on um, the hypocrisy in the church. I felt like there were just so many people around me that preached one thing and did another, and I think that I was so focused on this that I stopped being able to recognize where I fell short. And after coming here to Compass, I thought I needed to step up my Christianity. I got involved, started reading my Bible more, tried my hardest to stop living in secret sexual sin, but I could not stop. I was a slave to my sin. To have them point me to the cross because I, I didn't know. I didn't know the gravity of my sin before a holy God. So I prayed. I prayed that he would forgive all those sins that he showed me. I talked about all of the pain and hurt that I felt, and I talked about all of my sin, and I pleaded with him to forgive me and to give me a new life in him, and I'm just so thankful for his faithfulness to me to this day and the grace that he has shown me. Like, it's incredible. I, I repented right there. I just, I prayed and I asked the Lord to make me a new creation. I was ready to give up all of my sin put all my faith into the righteousness of Jesus Christ, not myself. I'm just grateful that God could forgive me of my sins, that he could be so loving enough to send his son to die for us. After mid mid Christ, the power of God changing me a lot. Everything is night and day. Everything. I'm saved by grace. God loved me. And that's all I'm here to say. Happy birthday, Compass HB. What a celebration we just had of six years of Jesus building his church right here in Huntington Beach. We had church on a Monday. We had some baptisms, and it was just encouraging for me all weekend, Saturday night, both services on Monday, to see so many of you that Jesus has saved over the last six years. And, and what a miracle this church is. I mean, from knowing there was no church and now seeing Jesus build his church and how many people have gotten saved, how many people six years ago I didn't even know and now they're like my family. It's just, it's a miracle. It's, I say that because it's a work only God could do. And he's done it even despite us. He's still shown his glory by saving and sanctifying and uniting together so many of us. And so this was really an encouraging weekend to celebrate what God has done for six years and to say, here's what we're gonna be about. We're gonna be about the Bible and experiencing revival. We're gonna read books like Kings and go right on into Isaiah. And today's chapter is 2 Kings 5. Now, if you've been paying attention in Kings, Elisha has been doing some miracles. And I really wanna encourage you to look up some cross references. Uh, as we go through 2 Kings 4, Elisha did some miracles with the widow's oil, how he raised the widow's son from the dead. Now, hopefully, when you read 2 Kings 4, that got you thinking back, hey, didn't Elijah basically do like these same kind of miracles? Didn't he give a widow free refills of oil? Didn't he raise a widow's son? So here's what I want you to do is look up some cross references as we're going to study some miracles of Elisha. Today, he's going to heal a leper named Naaman. Okay, well, I want you to see, well, is he kind of redoing some of the miracles that Elijah did? So maybe go earlier in Kings, like 
1 Kings 17 and see how Elisha is redoing some of the miracles of Elijah. But then here's what really makes it awesome. Both of them are just laying some groundwork of miracles and Jesus is going to be the one who does those miracles. Hey, does Jesus seem to give anybody free refills of food? Does Jesus raise any widow's sons? Can Jesus even do things beyond what Elijah or Elisha do where he doesn't even need to go and be there? He can just send somebody or say something and somebody rises from the dead. So what I would really love for you to do is trace some of the miracles of Elijah or Elisha. And where do we see Jesus do that miracle or even just take that miracle to the next level? Or where does he even talk about some of the miracles that Elijah and Elisha are doing in Kings? These are just setups for miracles that Jesus is going to do in the Gospels. So I would love for you to drop a gospel cross-reference. Where does a miracle of Jesus interact with some of the miracles that we're reading from Elijah and Elisha in Kings? Now in our chapter today, this guy Naaman, who is a Syrian, who we know at many times has been the enemies of the people of Israel, he is a leper and he is looking to get healed. So this opens up all kinds of possible cross-references where did Jesus heal lepers? Where did he interact or meet with people or heal people who were not Jews? There's a lot of possibilities. But I want to share a cross-reference that I have with 2 Kings 5. First of all, Naaman really gets it. He really gets what, what happens here. At first, he comes across very proud, like, you're, what, you're not even going to come out here and talk to me? You're not going to make some big presentation? You're just going to tell me to go wash myself? Like at first he comes across like, hey, I'm better than this. But look what Naaman says when it's all said and done. And this is 2 Kings 5 verse 17. Then Naaman said, if not, please let there be given to your servant two mule loads of earth. So he's trying to thank Elisha for what he's done. For from now on, your servant will not offer burnt offering or sacrifice to any God but Yahweh. That's an amazing thing for a Syrian who is not even in the nation of Yahweh, who's not even among the people of Israel, for him to say, I'm not worshiping any other God but Yahweh. I mean, this is Yahweh one way. This is a real, genuine response to God that Naaman is sharing here. Okay, so Naaman is... He, I mean, and he's even like, hey, if I have to go in in the house of Ramon and I have to go in when they're worshiping there, I'm not even going to worship Ramon in there if I have to go in there. I mean, he's even getting specific about how he's going to separate himself from the idolatry of his people and how he's only going to worship Yahweh. I mean, this is really, Naaman now is being raw. He, he's sharing a, a real change in his life. And how refreshing was it to see people get baptized? at church again. I mean, the testimonies were so encouraging to me. I mean, we had some art testimonies. I'm looking at the people speaking, how it articulately they're speaking. They were just nervous before, and now they're bringing it. They're quoting scripture. They're telling raw and honest truths about themselves that most people would never want people to know, and here they are saying it in front of our entire church. I mean, it's awesome to be about around the raw faith of new Christians. And that's what Naaman is here in 2 Kings 5. Now, in Luke chapter 4, here's my cross-reference for you. Luke 4, 27. Jesus goes to the synagogue in Nazareth, his hometown. We did a whole sermon uh, on this passage in Luke 4. Uh, we did a whole sermon right here on our Scripture of the Day YouTube channel from Israel when we went there. And Jesus is preaching in his hometown synagogue, and he's reading from Isaiah how the good news is going to go out to the, to the blind, the naked, the poor, the oppressed, the prisoners, how it's going to go out and it's going to be good news for all these people, right? And everybody's listening to Jesus read in the synagogue there in his hometown, Nazareth, and they're like, wow, Jesus has really got a gift of speaking. Wow, he's really got something to say. Wow, he speaks with authority. Like they're impressed by Jesus speaking but they don't realize Jesus is talking about them. And he's calling them blind, naked, poor, prisoners, oppressed. And so he has to kind of make his message more clear. And he says, yeah, even at the time of Elisha, there were many lepers in Israel. 
but he didn't go to the lepers in Israel. He went to Naaman, the Syrian. And after Jesus says that in Luke 4, 27, they get so mad at him in his hometown of Nazareth, they try to throw him off a cliff. And that's where we made the sermon. They try to push him off a cliff to kill him. See, this is the difference between somebody who just started believing like Naaman, who's expressing raw faith, and people who've been going to church for a long time think they already know it all, and then you imply to them that they're poor, they're naked, they need to change their ways, and in their pride, they get offended. See, that's the contrast that Jesus is making. That's the point of the story of the healing of Naaman the Syrian, is this guy really appreciated the grace that he was receiving. Whereas a lot of the Israelites, they acted like, yeah, well, of, of course God should be good to me. I'm one of his people. Like we deserve the blessings of God. Like we already know about God, and of course God should be good to us. See, this is the difference between real Christianity and people who just assume that they're Christians. One really appreciates grace, and the other thinks that they deserve it. And that's what Jesus is calling out in Luke 4 in the synagogue of Nazareth. That's what Naaman is exposing, that all these Israelites who have Yahweh, and they don't even just worship Yahweh, they compromise with idols. I mean, the people are always turning to idolatry. They're always turning to immorality. I mean, even most of Israel won't say, I won't worship any other God but Yahweh. Here's a Syrian who gets some, some mercy and grace and healing in his life. He's ready to go all Yahweh when they worship another God in his country. But the people of God, they won't even go all Yahweh in his own nation. It's so similar to what's happening right now. Where people are getting saved among us and they're raw and they're open and they're honest. But you try to get somebody who's going to church for 20, 30 years to confess some sin or share something honest and then I'll act like, why do I need to do that? I've already got it all together. That's what Jesus called out in his hometown of Nazareth and they ran him out of town. They tried to run him off a cliff. So it's good for us to hear the testimonies of new Christians. It's good for us to remember when God saved us, that amazing grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a poor, prisoner, blind, oppressed, naked, wretch like me. That's who Jesus saves. And when you know that you're that kind of person, it really is amazing grace. And so praise God for these testimonies, for people to be honest about their sin, amazed by Jesus, and really live in new lives. Simeon is an example of that happening here in 2 Kings 5. He's only going to worship God. And Jesus quotes a name in here, the Syrian. He quotes this story in Luke 4, 27 to make the point that, hey, you got to see yourself as a sinner before God. And you got to really respond to him. Don't just act like you know God because you grew up going to church, because you know what the Bible says. That's not the message. No, you know God because he saved a sinner like you through his son, Jesus Christ. That's what makes the grace so amazing. That's the story of Naaman from 2 Kings 5. And yes, we're celebrating six years of the miracle of what Jesus has done here at Compass HP, but I feel like we're just getting started. So I hope to see you for more here on Scripture of the Day. I knew the truth of God's Word and I ignored it to go deeper and deeper into sin, that even if I hid it from the whole world, God saw all my sin and he promised to judge that sin one day. People shared with me passages like 2 Corinthians 5.17 that says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And even though I had claimed to be in Christ, the old had not passed away. In secret, I had still been living in it. But this was the best part, that God showed this to me. Because through this, he opened my eyes to my need for Jesus Christ. And he did give me true joy genuine faith and he granted me repentance he's completely changed my life that's a secret pornography i was once enslaved to he's given me complete victory over i just can't describe and i just want to say in all of this i get no credit but jesus christ gets all the credit for this work that he's done in my life